Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Hello and welcome to this Global Leading Voices webinar. I'm Andrew Sharman. The topic today for discussion is five strategies to strengthen your safety culture using ISO 45001. Before I, get, I begin, please let me introduce myself. I uh, have spent around 20 years working in workplace safety, health and risk management in around 100 countries around the globe. On the screen in front of you, you get a potted summary of my CV. In addition to being chief executive of RMS, I am also a professor of leadership and safety culture at the Center for Executive Development on the INSEAD campus uh, just outside Paris in France. I'm also vice president of the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, IOSH, the world's biggest professional body for health and safety practitioners. And you can find out more information about IOSH at iosh.co.uk. As a day job, as chief executive of RMS, we consult with organizations around the globe on topics of safety culture in order to help them move forward towards excellence in safety and risk management. We have offices in the UK and in Switzerland, which is where I'm talking to you now from. You can find details about our business at rmsswitzerland.com. You can follow us on Twitter at rmarshaman. Our clients are typically large blue chip multinational corporations and non-governmental organizations, NGOs, people like the World Health Organization and the United Nations. What are we going to talk about today? Well, we have a broad topic and a large challenge to think about 45001 from a culture perspective. Specifically, I'm going to try and help us understand the new strategic challenges that ISO 45001 presents and suggest to you five ideas to help tackle those challenges that the new standard brings. I want to try and give a bit of a global perspective on safety and its evolution as I see it working globally with organizations around the world. I want to try to weave in some ideas around leadership too and particularly give you some tips on how we can maximize leadership potential when it comes to safety at work. To do that, I'm going to share with you some key safety leadership traits that I believe make the difference between good and great safety leaders. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about a theme from one of my books. The book's called From Accidents to Zero. And the key theme in that book is about creating safety. What I'm talking about here is a mindset shift from the traditional view of safety, which tends to be about preventing accidents from happening, to instead thinking about a forward-focused approach, where we concentrate on the inputs rather than the outputs, like LTI or accident frequency rates. <coughs> To do that, I, I want to look at some human factors and think a little bit about culture. So this is the agenda. I guess you could say that this is a story in three parts. The way that I'd like to structure this webinar is first to give you an overview of key elements of ISO 45001. Second, I'm going to present five new challenges as far as I see them that the standard brings for us to consider. And then the third part is some suggested responses things to think about as you're considering these new challenges that the new standard brings. As indicated in the previous slide, I also want to kind of give you a bit of a run through some ideas on safety, culture and leadership from my perspective. You can ask questions at any time using the chat box on your control panel and I'd be pleased to build in questions during the presentation as well as at the end. Any questions that we don't manage to get through, we can cover via email over the next few days. So let's begin if you're ready. It might be helpful to think about where we've come from in order to get to the new standard ISO 45001, which, as you probably know, has not yet been released. In fact, in the last couple of days, we've seen some uh, effective discussion about the current draft standard, and it's likely that we might see it released or published by the end of this year or early next year. So why ISO 45001? Well, it starts back in 1996 in Great Britain 
when BS 8800 came out uh, as a British standard. That was then developed into OSAS 18001 in 1999 to really respond to the growing demand for a certifiable standard. Since 1999, over 90,000 certifications have been issued against OSAS 18001 in 127 countries around the globe. So it's clearly picked up in terms of popularity and its effectiveness at building management systems has been recognized. However, it's still a British standard. So we need to find a new standard that helps build consensus, consistency, and set a truly international benchmark that goes beyond something that's applicable to British organizations. So that sets up the context and the need for a new standard, which becomes then 45,001 as we know it. What's the current status? Well, over 3,000 comments were received on the first draft that was created. That was called DIS, Draft International Standard, 45,001.2. So that first draft standard managed to get some great feedback, which encouraged the development of a second draft. That's currently out for ballot by national standards bodies in 70 countries around the world. That's slated for completion by the end of next month. If the ballot gets a result of 75% or more in favor of the second edition of the draft standard, then that will go straight to publication. And we anticipate the publication of ISO 45001 could be as early as the end of this year, 2017. However, in the last couple of days, you may have noticed some discussion online about some leading bodies who are not quite happy with the current version, the second draft, and suggesting that there's still more work to be done. So the result really will be dependent on that ballot at the end of July as to whether we're going to see 45,001 coming out at the end of this year or early next year. If there is more drafting required, then publication will push out, but likely that 45,001 will be released then as a publication in February next year. So what is ISO 45001? I expect if you're on this webinar, you've already done some reading and thinking about this new standard. Well, ISO 45001 is an international standard that specifies requirements for an OHS management system, and I've abbreviated it there to save you some space on future slides. It's applicable to any organization, in any sector, in any country, so applicable globally in every definition of that word. The design of the standard is known as an enabling standard in the sense that it's possible to integrate other aspects. Whilst 45001 is focused on occupational health and safety, well-being, for example, could also be integrated into that standard by you as an organization, and perhaps in the future by the standard bodies too, as wellness and well-being grows in interest for organizations around the world. So that's what 45001 is, but what is it not? Well, 45001 is not stating specific criteria for occupational health and safety performance. It's not prescriptive about the design of your OH and S management system. It's not addressing specific issues. It's not focused on, for example, product safety or environmental impact. It's a broad brush standard. And it's certainly not intended to be a legally binding document. Working yesterday with a client in Denmark, they suggested that they needed to have 45,001 in order to comply with the law. So perhaps there's still some misunderstanding as to what the standard is. One way to consider it is that it's a framework on which to grow a management system. Uh, and uh, you can consider a metaphor perhaps of a trellis to, to grow flowers or plants against. That's really what 45001 is about. So if we think of the main characteristics, it's a preventative system. It's trying to avoid accidents and ill health happening in the workplace. Interestingly, like OSAS 18001 and HSG 65, the guidance document that comes from the British Workplace Safety Regulator, the Health and Safety Executive, it takes a risk-based approach. Uh, and that's a pretty pragmatic move forward, I think. What's interesting for me is it goes back to basics and takes us through the Plan, Do, Check, Act model. This I think really summarizes the simplicity of the standard and helps to make it easier for organizations, particularly small organizations, to get to grips 
with what the standard's about and utilize it effectively. Perhaps the most important characteristic of 45001 is its commonality. It's been deliberately designed with the high, same high-level structure as all new management system standards, for example, 9001 and 14001. Why is that important? Well, because it sets out a common structure of the standard in terms of clauses, terms, and definitions. And that should enable integration across these management systems within an organization, rather than having one management system for safety, a different one for quality, another for environment. You can now take a unified approach to one management system that just happens to deal with these different subjects. And, and that, for me, is a real great advantage of this new standard. What are the other benefits? Well, of course, applying 45001 can help you minimize occupational health and safety risks. It can improve performance and help you, as I just suggested, integrate occupational health and safety more broadly into business management systems and processes. In terms of structure, these are the 10 clauses within 45001. And I've highlighted one in particular here, number five, leadership and worker participation because that's a key difference to 18001 and other standards that we've been used to in occupational health and safety. So, so let's contrast 18001 and 14, 45001. Let's see what the key differences are. The first is that 45001 takes this preventive approach. The second is that it thinks about the context of the organization. It suggests that you as an organization thinking about 45,001 need to consider wider issues, such as supply chain, local community, and cultural, social, political, legal, economic, and government, governance settings too. It focuses particularly on leadership. And interestingly for health and safety practitioners, I think this provides a useful lever to get top management taking a more active role in setting direction, building trust, promoting a culture of safety, and to communicate more clearly. In addition to that, Clause 5 goes on to extend that out to bring more focus on worker engagement at all levels, not just at shop floor level, but by top management too, to ensure that more non-managerial participation happens right through the business. So now 45001 is setting a framework for engagement and communication at every level of the business, from shop floor to boardroom. Finally, 45,001 different to 18,001 in the sense that it requires you to evaluate your performance, but also the efficiency of your operations as you think about occupational health and safety. So in summary, organizations should ensure that there's effective OHMS risk management in place and it's integral to the success of your operations. The keys to doing that through 45,001 are strong leadership, worker involvement, competency and culture and that kind of brings us towards the link to this webinar because beyond 45,001 helping us to reduce injuries it can also when we think about it from a cultural perspective help us boost our reputation enhance leadership and resilience and ensure a sustainable socially responsible future for our businesses so that's an overview of 45001 with some highlights and some challenges that I think it suggests to us. I want to now try to draw out five strategic challenges from the new international standard and suggest how we might respond to those from a cultural and leadership perspective. The first strategic challenge that I see is that 40% of the core text in all ISO management system standards will be the same from now on. Now, I mentioned that just a moment ago and said that that means that the language of 45001 and the structure and the definitions of the words used will be the same as other management system standards, 9001 and 14001, for example, but of course there are other management system standards that you may be familiar with. Well, that's good news in the sense that it's gonna make things easier to integrate systems and to facilitate an, an integrated or whole system approach to auditing rather than having separate audits for safety, environment, quality, and so on. We can now anticipate a single audit for the organization that covers Q, H, S, and E. 
But the question is, what does this really mean for your organization? And how will you go through that practice of integration? Certainly, with my IOSH hat on as vice president of the world's largest institution for health and safety practitioners, we know that there's been a move towards joining up of the different disciplines. And many of you on this call may have responsibility for not just safety, but also for health and perhaps environment and perhaps quality and perhaps security and perhaps risk management too. So as the roles become more integrated, how do we make it efficient to integrate these systems within our business? Well, my suggested answer for that challenge is that we need to create a common language of safety for our organizations. A question I often like to ask our consulting clients is, well, what is safety? Go ahead and just take a moment right now and see if you can write down your definition, just in a couple of lines or so. What's your definition of safety? If you'd like to suggest ideas, you can pop them into the chat room or offer it as a question too. I'd be pleased to see what you think. So what is safety? How would you define it? Well, quite often, safety is defined in terms of failure. Things go wrong due to technical, human, and organizational causes. I mean, we badge those as failures or malfunctions, don't we? The focus then for organizations tends to be on preventing accidents and making sure as few things as possible go wrong. Safety for many people, perhaps for you in your definition, is often defined as the absence of accidents. Do these definitions resonate with you? I imagine that you've probably put something down about absence of accidents or injuries and making sure that we prevent recurrence of those sorts of things. It might be interesting for you to ask this same question, what is safety in your organization? I'm surprised that when I ask this question, to large groups of leaders in businesses around the world, how diverse their definitions are. Just yesterday at a global leadership conference of 130 top leaders of a large industrial multinational, I asked that question and asked them to, to give me their key words. And we had more than 30 different definitions of what safety is. Well, given that definitions will be clearly set out in 45001 and other management system standards will have similar definitions. Maybe now's the time for you to start thinking about defining keywords, key phrases, and key targets in your business so that when that standardization of 45001 kicks in, you're ready and prepared for that. The language of safety is an interesting thing, and, and I've had a lot of fun writing about it in my book, From Accidents to Zero, which I'll give you details of at the end of this session. But let's think about a second challenge. The old phrase POPIMAR, policies, organizing, planning, implementing, measuring, auditing, and reviewing, that was there in 18,001 and in other management systems is gone. 45,001 will not continue with POPIMAR. Instead, it refers back to that old ancient quality technique of plan, do, check, act that's become very popular in management books and leadership journals over the last few years. This is about setting out the policy and the planning for implementation. It's about thinking about risk registers and risk profiles and how you organize your structure to move forward. It's about how you implement your plan and measure your performance, whether that's around accidents, incidents, or perhaps more forward thinking, looking at the inputs to your safety management system. And then finally, the ACT phase is about reviewing performance and learning lessons. You can see from the diagram that I've given you here on the screen that I think there's a, a real ease of transferring the old Poppymar approach into Plan, Do, Check, Act. But are you ready for that? Perhaps your management systems are based on 18,001. So what is it that you're planning for? How able are you going to be at integrating and moving forward to 45,001? For those of you who are currently certified to 18,001, you're going to have three years after the publication of 45,001 to switch over to that new standard to adjust your management system and get ready. 
And it's likely that those of you who are qualified as 18,001 auditors will need to undergo some sort of extra training. At the moment, there's talk of a day to a day and a half of additional training to make that conversion from 18,001 to 45,001. So my suggestion here in response to this challenge is that now I think is the right time to start rethinking your targets and plans and moving from a, a, a reactive or outcome-based focus, looking at accident frequency rates, lost time injury rates, and so on, to instead starting to work forward in the direction of the standard uh, and facing the future by looking at the inputs rather than the outputs of your systems. Now, when it comes to strategy, a lot of our clients often say, well, we were just unlucky when it came to those accidents. And they, they talk about luck playing a big factor. Now, I don't think luck is really a great strategy for safety, because the only difference between good luck and bad luck, right, is the outcome. I'm sure you've all had those moments where you started off with the best intentions, but something goes wrong, and you blame it on bad luck on the journey home. But there's the kind of luck that leaves us kind of out in the cold and feeling embarrassed. There's the sort of luck that leaves us wondering how we get out of that situation. There's the sort of luck that leaves us speechless. There's the sort of luck that makes us wonder how we're going to tell our bosses. And the sort of luck that well, we can't help but smile at the irony of this lady's choice of clothing on the day she chose to sit on the wet paint of the same color. So luck, I don't think, is a strategy. So what else could we do? Well, often it's about rules, isn't it? In occupational health and safety, Practitioners are often keen to build structure and process, so rules and systems to gain compliance in terms of behaviors tend to be the next step. But this compliance focus is not necessarily in the spirit of ISO 45001. Instead, remember, this is about participation and leadership, so that's pointing towards behavior and culture being the clue. Now, before we talk more about behavior and culture, let's just think about targets, because it's been popular for the last decade or so for organizations to have targets around zero accidents or zero injuries, with lots of organizations around the world proclaiming that safety is their first priority. I'm worried about both of these phrases, zero accidents and safety first. I'm not surprised that they exist in safety, because zero particularly is something that's all around us, from zero emission cars to zero fat yogurt to, to zero coke. Now, the interesting thing about zero is that it comes from the Italian word zephira, which comes, uh, the Italian word, pardon me, excuse me, the Italian word zephira, which comes from the Arabic safira. And that original Arabic word safira means empty or nothingness. Now, with the greatest of respect to Coca-Cola, a product which I love in its usual red full fat form, when I taste Coke Zero, it kind of tastes of nothing to me. I much prefer the red original Coke. Uh, and I think even Coca-Cola have realized this. Their new advert here in Europe for Coke Zero is that it tastes more like Coke and it looks more like Coke. Well, forgive me for speaking out of turn, but isn't that the job of Coke? to taste like Coke and to look like Coke. But it's not just Coke that faces this challenge of zero. I was working in Tokyo recently, and on the subway ride back to my hotel, I noticed this banner for strong zero beer. I noticed certainly the 9% alcohol on the side, and in the interest of scientific research, of course, I tracked down a can of this stuff and tried it out that evening. When I put it into the glass, I was surprised. I should have paid more attention to the advert. Perhaps you've noticed that the glass he's holding shows a clear liquid. That was what I found when I poured it out too. So this is beer that doesn't look like beer. It's a little bit ominous. But I took a sip to try it out. And sure enough, I felt the 9% alcohol straight away. But I didn't get much more. Beer that doesn't taste like beer... Coke that doesn't taste like Coke, yogurt that doesn't taste like strawberries. All of these little research experiments I've been trying out for you have led me to 
a very clear conclusion that the absence of something doesn't mean the existence of something else. Now let's apply that logic to safety. Many of you will be familiar with a chart that looks like this. Perhaps some of you even present charts like this, where you show over the last few months the lost time injury rate, and hopefully it's heading in the right direction for you. Now when you play this out at your leadership team meetings, what's normally the response? What's the discussion? Well, a lot of safety practitioners tell me they're often responded to with comments of, well done, this looks good, and then encouraged to keep going. And that often is the end of the discussion about safety in many boardrooms. I'm worried about charts like this because I'm not sure that they really give us a good indication of how safe an organization is. In fact, I'd go as far as saying they're not really LTI charts, they're LGI. They're looking good indexes. The only purpose they really serve is for leaders in the business to say, oh yes, looks good, keep going, and to instill a false sense of confidence. We need to look at other measures, I think, to give us better confidence of how we're doing when it comes to safety at work. You know, that false sense of confidence was apparent here on this oil platform. When at 11 o'clock in the morning on April the 20th, senior leaders flew in by helicopter to celebrate seven years without an injury. Some of you, I'm sure, are already guessing that this is Deepwater Horizon. Sure enough, it is. You know the story. The rig explodes, killing 11 and seriously injuring 17 others in what is undoubtedly the worst environmental disaster of our lifetime. Seven years without a lost time injury and then suddenly an event that causes the death of 11 and serious harm to 17 more, can that be possible? Well, I'm not sure it can. In fact, what this case demonstrates to us is similar to that can of beer in Japan or the yogurt in my refrigerator. That the absence of something doesn't mean the existence of something else. Or in simple terms, the absence of accidents does not mean the existence of safety. Well, why is that important to us, and what's it got to do with 45,001? Well, 45,001, as you know now, focuses on us looking at our performance and the efficiency of the activities that we do. Specifically, the strategic challenge that comes next for us then is that auditors can now go to any level of staff. That's not been the case with 18,001 or 9,001 or 14,001. So that means the auditors that you invite into your business can go right up to the boardroom. So the question that needs to be answered is, what will your CFO do when he or she is asked, what's your role in safety? How do you think they'd answer that question? And what would the chief executive say? And what about the members of the board? These people will all be involved in audits moving forward. So getting our language right and making sure that we're clear about what we're really trying to achieve can be a step in the right direction. Let's go back to Deepwater Horizon just for a moment. The United States National Commission co-chair William Riley said in his report there was a classic failure of leadership and management in BP where safety concerns took a back seat to the pursuit of the remarkable financial returns. Riley's claim was there was emphatically not a culture of safety on that rig. My suggestion for you then is that it's time to engage the senior team in a different way. And one way you can think about that is to ask them what's important to them. What is it that really matters? Why should you do that? Well, let's go back to Deepwater Horizon. The Chemical Safety Board Chairman, Carolyn Merritt, said, it's my sincere hope and belief that our report on Deepwater Horizon and the recent Baker report establishes a new standard of care for corporate boards and CEOs throughout the world. She went on to say that safety programs need to deserve the same level of attention, investment and scrutiny as the way your organizations look at finance. And boards of directors now of all companies should examine every detail of safety programs to ensure that no other event like Deepwater Horizon ever occurs. Now you'll notice the conspicuous absence of reference to the oil and gas industry here. Why is that important? 
Well, because this statement sets a line in the sand for all organizations in all industry sectors. If we think about how safety has evolved in business, we know that the cost of poor safety is rising. In the UK, the annual cost to society is around £14 billion. Pounds. For a long time, we've been hearing the phrase, good safety is good business. There's stacks of reports and research out there now that shows that every one pound spent generates a hundred pounds plus return on investment. So if you're looking for a way to persuade the top team to move forward with 45,001 and really engage their leadership, perhaps this return on investment data could be useful for you. And you can search for this and find it easily on the internet right now, particularly if you look for the countries that I've listed here. The prosecution landscape is also changing across the world. Last year in the UK, 34 leaders were personally fined for safety failings, and 12 of them ended up in prison. Fines against organizations are also rising by 43% typically, year on year. For Deepwater Horizon, BP were fined $20.8 billion. DuPont were recently fined $2 million, plus ongoing settlements for a chemical leak that caused four fatalities at that plant in the port, Texas. Network Rail in the UK, a $4 million fine for customer fatality. And a production company that caused a lost time injury to the Hollywood megastar Harrison Ford on the set of the most recent Star Wars movie were fined $2 million for that. And then perhaps you've also heard of the Alton Towers tragic case of amputations to people riding on a roller coaster. That theme park, as well as being shut down for a period of time, was also fined £5 million for that accident. So fines going up cost of poor safety going up, but the research showing that good safety is good business also increasing too. I think there's some great arguments here for the top team. But this so far has been retrospectively focused, and I think we've got to take a new view. Looking over our shoulder at the accidents that have happened in the past is not enough to take us forward. We've got to instead ensure that we focus on things going right. And as I suggested to you at the beginning of this webinar, we need to create safety, not prevent accidents. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't investigate things that go wrong, but of course we need to make sure we focus more on the inputs. What am I talking about? Well, really we need to realize that things go well in our workplaces, not because people dogmatically follow the rules and policies, but because the sensible people that we employ adjust sensibly to the demands of the situations that they find themselves in. So, what is it that happens on ordinary days in your workplace? You know those days where things just seem to go right? We hit our targets for quality, for productivity, for safety, and everybody goes home in one piece. What is it that's worked well there? Have you ever thought about that question? Perhaps it's about clarity of communication, teamwork, great leadership, everybody understanding their roles and how to do them well, and being competent to deliver success. So don't wait for something bad to occur. Try digging into those ordinary days to find out what the secrets to success are in your culture and then leveraging those. Let's link this back to 45,001 and the fourth strategic challenge. Worker participation has been definitely included here in clause five, the leadership clause of 45,001. So as I've indicated before, managerial grades at all levels now will be consulted and need to participate in every stage of the management system. So how are you going to handle that? Well, my suggestion is that we need to start taking a more human-focused approach rather than a systems-focused approach when it comes to workplace safety. So get your pens and pencils ready again. I've got another question for you, hopefully an easy one. What is culture? Well, we talk about culture on a regular basis, but do we ever really define it? What does culture mean for your organization? If we conducted a survey of just this one question in your business, what would the answers be? Well, I suspect there'd be things like sets of attitudes, beliefs, and values that are shaped by systems, procedures, and leadership that generate what we call social norms. This is from a classic definition of behavior and culture by the likes of people including Eisen, Shine, Skinner, and more. They've all pointed towards these sorts of things. These social norms are important because they reinforce and regulate individual and group behaviors. In parallel, 
to the rules that you've created in your management systems and policies. I guess simply we could say culture is the way we do things around here. So if we think about culture as the social norms, the way we do things, what's safety culture? This one often confuses people as they think, well, hang on, is it something special? But we can be quite simplistic here and say, well, if culture is how we do things around here, safety culture must then be right, how we do safety around here. In our business, we use a cultural safety model that takes us through a fairly standard process. You'll be familiar with something like this, I'm sure, where it moves in one direction from avoiding safety through levels of compliance to a more generative or human focus and then fully integrated approach. But I think that there's a trap in most of those culture models. And the trap is that they seem to suggest that there's only one direction running through organizational cultural maturity, that you just continue on in one direction until you become interdependent or generative. Not so. I think an organization's culture can move up and down through that ladder. There's also a risk that they can fall off the culture ladder. And here in the middle of this uh, model here, you'll notice that there's a choice of direction. As organizations get comfortable with compliance, many organizations spiral off into a black hole of systems obsession and wonder how to get back out of that. They think the answer to improved safety is more rules, more policies, more procedures. I don't think that's the case. And 45,001 seems to suggest that's true. <coughs> Documents, as we've known them in the past, those sheets of paper and files and manuals that we've pulled out when the auditors turn up, those are out as far as 45,001 is concerned. There's a new phrase in 45,001 that talks about documented records. This is not sheets of paper. I think 45,001 recognizes the advent of technology uh, and the mobile applications that we use. There's some brilliant applications coming out now from people like the guys in Nord Safety in Finland, for example, and GenSuite, who are really thinking differently about the needs of us as practitioners and the needs of our organizations when it comes to the technology that can help us. So you don't need to print off and download Excel spreadsheets and vast reports to show your auditors. You'll be able to show auditors your mobile technology in real time and demonstrate how you're keeping records rather than documents. I think this is great news because it means that what you can include in your audits of 45,001 is much broader and also a little bit more relaxed. Those days of filling tables and meeting rooms with folders and pieces of paper are long gone as soon as 45,001 comes out. So my strategic suggestion here is you've got to get out of the proof of compliance trap, that systems obsession that I just talked about. And here's a tip here. If you want to get to the top of that safety culture ladder, if you want to get to fully integrating safety or being more human focused, you can't do it by being more systems obsessed. We know from our assessments of culture in businesses around the world and our work with our clients to improve and mature that culture, that in a strong safety culture, everybody demonstrates safety as a core value. They understand what they should do and are open to new ideas and suggestions about how to work. People want to make a difference and truly understand their behavior at a personal level makes a difference too. Managers in great safety cultures don't just manage, they step up and rise to the challenge of leadership too. And critically, managers in great safety cultures view the behaviors and perceptions of others as reflections of their own leadership. We've had some great success in developing safety culture and leadership in our clients around the world. And here's some of the outputs that we see from the processes when we partner with them. And you'll notice that this is not just about lagging indicators like lost time injuries, but leading indicators like near misses, employee engagement, felt safety leadership, and abilities and confidence to get involved in safety at all levels of the hierarchy in the business. So what are we talking about when we consider leadership? We know we're going to have to think more about it in 45,001. Well, leadership, I think, is in crisis in the UK 
a third of all employees describe their bosses as poor leaders. In the States, 70% of American workers say the boss doesn't provide a clear picture of what great performance looks like. Around the world, nearly one in every two workers feel disconnected from their leaders. And two-thirds of employees globally don't trust their managers. You might be asking, okay, big figures, but where does this come from? It's from a range of UK and US governmental task forces, plus the Mercer survey of 400,000 organizations around the world. I think all three of those reports are pointing to the fact today that leadership today is in crisis. So what are we talking about? Well, leadership is not management. These things are different. It's not about positional title or seniority, and it's not about education. For me, leadership is more about influence and relationships. It's about walking the talk. It's about sharing control and mobilizing people to take action in the right direction. It's about showing the way forward through clarity of vision and challenging people to think as well as do. It's also about asking the right questions, not necessarily having the right answers to everything. As leaders, whether we're in safety, quality, operations, or any other aspect of our business, the days of knowing everything about our subject have long gone. Now, instead, it's about engaging others to build a strength of knowledge collectively. So many of you on this call, I suspect, might be safety leaders right now, or looking to lead a change in safety in your business. Well, what is it that makes a great safety leader? How do we differentiate? Well, I think that there are some specific X factors. We can go back in time to understand what those might be by taking a lesson first from Aristotle, who says, excellence is not an act, but a habit. You know, this idea of doing something time after time after time also resonates with another thought leader. Einstein said, setting an example is not the main means of influencing other people, it's the only means. And then perhaps my favorite quote on leadership comes from two and a half thousand years ago from Xenophon, a student of Socrates, who said, the true test of a leader is when the followers adhere to his cause from their own volition without being forced to do so and remaining steadfast. Of course, the language here is a little bit clunky, but what Xenophon was really saying is, you're only a really a leader if people want to follow you and stick with you through their own choice. So what is it that we can do to help people follow us and stick with us and see our commitment to safety? I think the answer lies in speaking from our heart and showing genuine concern and commitment to safety. It's about asking the right questions, as I'd indicated before. And here's a couple of suggestions on things that you might like to start asking workers in your business. The first, if I were working with you today, what would I need to know in order to be able to work safely? This question, particularly when asked to shock floor workers, allows them the opportunity to reflect on what's important from a safety perspective, and then to share their knowledge with you. And of course, we all like to share knowledge, particularly when the person receiving it indicates that they're grateful for it. So there's a great start to a safety dialogue here with this question. The second question, what improvements would you like to see around here? Now, we can put the word safety into this question if we like. Regardless of how we ask it, it shows that we're interested in other people's points of view. And of course, recognizing their response gives them some strength of commitment that we're recognizing that they have value in contributing to the success of our business. The third question, what would make being safe easier? This one's a great one because it's really open and it encourages people to be creative with their thought process, to come up with suggestions, even the smallest, that might just make a difference. And then finally, my colleague Tim Marsh loves this question and has great success with leaders around the globe as he shares it with them. When he asks, what's slow and convenient or uncomfortable about doing this job safely? And this one gets right at the heart of the challenges that stand in the way and trip us up when it comes to creating great safety behavior and culture. Why don't you try asking these questions over the next few days and see what sort of result you get in your safety dialogues. They might just have some keys to opening more success in safety for you. This is important because it doesn't matter what our role is. As a leader, the lowest standard that we demonstrate is the highest standard the organization can expect to achieve. 
when you ask these great questions on a daily basis, as a habit, as Aristotle suggests, then I think it helps boost our safety culture more broadly. Because great safety leadership is something that we do every day. It demonstrates our personal commitment. It should be easy to see and feel that great safety leadership doesn't necessarily come from our documents or our management systems. It's relevant to context and makes a positive impression in a way that recognizes and celebrates success, even micro successes like recognizing someone's wearing the right safety protective equipment or working in the right way or offering a suggestion that can help improve things at work. So in wrapping up just before inviting your questions, what have I tried to share with you over the last 45 minutes? Well, in summary, I've suggested that ISO 45001 will change the way we manage safety. The new standard, when it comes out at the end of this year or the beginning of next year, will drive a step change in management systems, not just in safety, but as it integrates further across other disciplines too. The risk-based approach will be much more pragmatic for us as practitioners and leaders to get our hands around and work with. And the integratability of 45001 will pull safety into the spotlight of management systems in our businesses as it becomes easier to connect into things like 9001 and 14001. The strong focus in 45001 on leadership and behavior is good news for those of us who are interested in culture and behavioral change. But we need to remember that great culture is all about people, not procedures. So focus on that clause five and see what we can do to engage our leaders and our workers on doing things differently. One way to do that is to make sure that we get our language right across the business. Thinking about the definitions right now that are contained in 45001 and then using those to base definitions of other words and phrases in our business could be a really useful preparatory step if you're anticipating using 45001 moving forward. And then finally, in this last section, I've suggested to you that excellence is a daily habit. Excellence is not about preventing bad things happening. Of course, that's important. But excellence is about being forward focused, looking at the inputs rather than the outputs, and creating safety in our workplace on a daily basis. One way to start doing that is to ask more questions rather than telling more answers. I ask plenty of questions to you in this book, From Accidents to Zero. It's now the best-selling safety culture book of all time, with more than 16,000 copies sold since its initial launch in 2014. There are 26 chapters in this book taking you in alphabetical order from accidents through behavior and culture right up to zero. Each chapter is only a few pages long. The largest chapter actually is only five pages. At the end of each chapter, there are reflection questions to get you thinking about what you could do to improve your workplace safety culture. There's over 80 of those ideas and reflection points in the book. And attendees of this webinar can get 20% discount on the book by going to fromaccidentstozero.com and using the exclusive PCB webinar discount code FATZ20, FATZ20 at fromaccidentstozero.com. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to invite you now for some questions, but first hand you back to Hannah to hear the organizer of this webinar. Hannah, please. Thank you, Andrew, for this informative presentation. So before we proceed with the question and answer session, I would like to inform you that PCB provides training and certification services for OSAS 18001 Introduction, Foundation, Lead Implementer, and Lead Auditor. OSAS 18001 helps you in reducing your workplace hazards and also protecting the safety, health, and welfare of the people engaged in your workplace. Also, please be informed that upon the publication of ISO 45001, PCB will offer training and certification services for this standard. A PCB certificate will demonstrate your dedication in implementing and managing these processes, and most importantly, you will be recognized worldwide. For more information, please visit our website, www.pcb.com. Now, without further ado, you will read some of the questions from attendees regarding today's presentation. So the first question is, what are some actions that can be taken to improve uh, 
to make improvements in safety culture? Uh, I've got an easy answer to that one. Uh, and that's uh, buy a copy of the From Access to Zero book. You'll find 80 ideas in there that can help you drive safety culture forward. But I think ultimately what this is about is getting to understand what it is that your culture really needs. So what are the traits and the cultural clues of your organization's culture? How is it that it currently works? What's it like to work there? And where are the opportunities for improvement? We don't need to have all the answers, remember, so perhaps start by asking questions to your workforce about what it is that's on their mind about how you guys work in safety. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, how can governments be encouraged to implement safety in daily operations in all agencies? How can governments integrate safety in their agencies on a daily basis? Well, I think the management system standard 45001 helps set out a nice framework for doing that. And, uh, and this idea of participation at all levels, from top-down leadership to shop floor, is key to that success. Again, I think it goes back to, to leaning on the standard as a framework for action, but also asking the organization what it wants. And that doesn't matter whether it's a government agency or a commercial organization. Listening to what the workers have to say is an important step forward. Of course, a traditional approach of Plan Do Check Act, like 45001 suggests, is crucial to help us understand what the risks are that our workers face, and they put mitigation and control measures in place from there. Okay, thank you, Andrew. So another uh, question is how to measure safety culture in terms of KPI? In our business, RMS, we have a proprietary model that measures safety culture, and we look at things like worker participation, clarity of leadership, understanding of procedures, and so on. We'd be happy to talk about how we measure that with you, and you can drop me an email directly at andrew at rmsswitzerland.com, and I'd be happy to share some suggestions with you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. So another question from the attendees is, how can private sector be encouraged to implement a safety culture within their organizations? Well, Calvin Coolidge, the former president of the United States, said years ago that the business of business is business. Uh, and I think he was right then. Of course, nowadays, if we ask the CFOs and the CEOs of your business what their business is, they'll no doubt refer to the importance of return on investment. So I think the way to encourage private businesses is to show the value that good safety brings to the business, show the return on investment, show how less accidents equals more people at work, and how more people at work feeling more engaged and more motivated to do a great job is good news for the business. And you'll find lots of research available. For example, if you go to iosh.co.uk, you can find some great research reports on there that show the value and return on investment for safety activities. That can be an interesting place to start. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, because of time limitation, we will only be answering one more question, while the rest of the questions will be answered by Andrew via email. So the last question is, please uh, give example on how we focus on inputs rather than on outcomes. Okay, so um, uh, again, I, I suppose I'd refer you to the book From, from Accidents to Zero. I think the, the answers there uh, in this book show the sorts of inputs that you could focus on. But you know some of these ideas already. What sorts of behaviors would you want to see more of? So perhaps you might like to see more employees leading safety committee meetings or employees leading accident investigations or senior leaders getting actively involved in serious injury investigations. Many of these sorts of things might be some of the inputs that you want to see. Perhaps it's also about the number of suggestions or improvement activities that come in from, from workers through suggestion schemes. Another one might be if you're using Lean Six Sigma in your business, perhaps you could look at the number of safety-related projects that go through Lean Six Sigma at yellow or green belt phase, for example. So these sorts of things, depending on what you're doing in your business, could be interesting ways of measuring inputs and setting up leading indicators rather than just lagging indicators. Thank you once again, Andrew, for this incredible presentation. It was an honor having you as our presenter. I would also like to thank all the attendees for taking the time out of their busy schedules and joining us. 
Please be reminded that this webinar will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel and also on our SlideShare account. We hope you enjoyed our webinar and we wish you a wonderful day.